here and for this opportunity of uh, presenting a little bit regarding my research and some perspectives that I uh, have for some years doing research. Uh, so, okay, uh, I'll start discussing just a few minutes about myself and my uh, working experience in education, then you can know a little bit more about me. Then we go for uh, some control challenges and some problems that we have in power electronics area and how can we, how can we overcome that problems. And later on, then we go for the, some perspectives for our future in terms of what the grid will become and what we can do and what are the main, uh, the next steps, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, as uh, Professor told us, uh, I come from Brazil, right? <laughs> Actually from stream south of Brazil. That's very near Argentina, Uruguay. So it's kind of cold like here, but it's, it's cold, but not like here, right? Here is wild. We don't have that much snow and stuff, but uh, it's a nice place. And I get my, uh, my uh, graduate in uh, Federal University of Santa Maria, this one here is the same city, Santa Maria, the city that I was born in the interior of this state here, the southern state. And I did my master's and PhD in this power electronics and control group here. It's the biggest in, uh, in Latin America, so we do a lot of power electronics and control focus. So uh, the CDC, the CAC, mother drives, and we support a lot of people, for example, I'm here now, we have a lot of other uh, friends that are in Europe and working worldwide, uh, all from GPOC. Uh, so uh, that's my family. Uh, we are here in the US now, and this is our first day of snow. And if you're wondering about our dog, yeah, we imported a 50 pounds dog from Brazil. That was very complicated, but she's family, then she's here with us, that's Leia. So in, basically in December 2021, I got my PhD there. In July 2022, I joined here at uh, University of Michigan Dearborn on US as a research fellow. A few months later, I was uh, asked to, to get an uh, adjunct lecture role, so I started teaching. And later on, I was promoted for research investigator. Then I had much more uh, freedom to do my research. I could submit proposals and try to get funding. And now in uh, Fall 2024, I'll start as a system professor role over there. So my main areas of research are regarding uh, control. So I, I'm the control guy, very theoretical. I do a lot of math, but we are engineers, right? So we need to apply stuff. Then I also have uh, tried to see how can we apply our controllers uh, in power electronics, drives, power systems, right? So basically my main focus is nonlinear control, adaptive control and sliding modes model operative, but much more adaptive. So yeah, that's it for me. Uh, my research experience, so basically I have a lot of papers in several very good journals, uh, focusing much more on this uh, adaptive control, sliding mode, how can we use these complicated techniques in control? How can we uh, overcome some problems that we have in power electronics and power systems, right? Because sometimes, I'm not saying that the classics are bad, don't understand me bad in this way, but uh, sometimes the classes cannot solve the problem because the problems are very, very harsh to solve, right? So, yep. So let's discuss a little bit about control challenges in power electronics and power systems. I'll uh, give a, try to give a briefly uh, uh, perspective about the, renewer, the renewable energy sources that we have on the US, uh, the problematics, the, per the, the potential, and some problems that we have in the grid. How can we overcome these problems, right? So. <coughs> Uh, you're free to, uh, to raise your hand. You can stop me anytime. Let's try to get a discussion here, right? So totally fine with that. Yeah. Any uh, issue, question, comment, just we can keep going. Yep. So uh, the impact, what is the impact of the renewable energy sources in uh, US, right? US is very big and we have a lot of potential for uh, renewable energy sources. So a lot of solar potential, wind, geothermal, water, not that much, biopower also not that much, but a lot of uh, solar and wind, right? So, but if we check about our main uh, uh, energetic matrix, we see that we burn a lot of coal and natural gas, right? So that's, what in, uh, but we have a lot of uh, uh, potential here in terms of renewable. So why cannot we go, uh, uh, we are doing this kind of slow transitioning, right? From time to time, but uh, that's not that simple because when we check the, population density map of US, we see that we have a lot of population in this area here, this area here, right? But when you check the uh, wind potential, 
and the solar potential, we see that we have a lot of solar potential in this area and a lot of wind potential in this area. But most of these areas are mountains, right? And most of these areas here, does, for the solar perspective, doesn't have too much uh, big cities nearby. So what's the problem of that? Uh, if we generate maybe, it's renewable, right? So we try to get the, ma the maximum efficiency that we have because uh, we want to get more, uh, something that's uh, uh, not that get, have, have too much environmental impact, right? So it's very important to be efficient in the renewables. So the problem is that if we generate uh, energy from this point, for example, and there's no too much big cities to consume this energy, then we have to transmit this to another part. And if you think about it, maybe uh, 100 kilowatts, right? 1% of losses is one kilowatt is very low, right? But if we think about it, 100 gigawatts, 1% of losses is a lot. One gigawatt is a lot to just waste, right? Because we, don't, we cannot consume that much. So uh, it's something that we also have to keep in mind that uh, the transition from the old uh, forms of uh, getting in, uh, electrical energy to the newer ones, the more, the more uh, safe for the environment, uh, they need to happen for sure, but uh, that's not that simple, right? So we cannot do this from one day to another, for example. So uh, let's discuss about a little bit the keep going this impact of renewable energy sources. So if you have a nice C microgrid, for example, and uh, this is an AC microgrid, so we have a lot of renewable energy generation here, PV, battery systems, wind turbines, and we need power electronics to do this integration between the renewable energy sources and our conventional grid, right? Because uh, we need to uh, do some, we need to condition this, the power and the signal, right? Sometimes we have to elevate the power and sometimes we have to convert from DC to AC and go back, right? So we need a lot of power electronics. So what's the problematic of doing that? Power electronics come with uh, high switching frequency, right? So we s insert flickering, we have harmonics, we have shattering, we have a lot of problems that uh, power electronics are generating actually for just because they are there and we need to overcome these problems. So this is a, a typical structure for a DCAC converter. So we have a full bridge, a low pass filter here, the point of common coupling and our electrical grid, right? Uh, we read these voltage currents and we do our control system to modulate the switches here and uh, generate in, uh, insert this uh, current here into the grid, right? Supposing that this is a, a PV or wind system, for example. So mostly we have two kinds of uh, converters for doing that, grid forming, grid following, right? Grid following are the older ones that we are very used to, and grid following are the new ones. So we can do some kind of parallel. Uh, what's the main difference of that? So we can, if we think about our grid AC system as an axis, a mechanical axis, right? And the grid forming, uh, the grid following actually, the ones that they, uh, the main difference from these kind of two types of converters is that the grid following, as the name say, they follow the grid. So we need synchronize, synchronization. We need to observe the grid behavior and uh, uh, be sure that we are syncing current and uh, voltage to uh, aim a power factor of one, right? Because it, we don't want to wa waste energy. However, the grid forming inverters, they, are a step uh, further because they also can generate the voltage in the point of common coupling and we, they can also be the, uh, the role of the voltage, the grid itself. So uh, this, this is the main difference. In terms of control, uh, the grid forming, we need to also control the voltage in the grid because for the grid following, we don't know about the vo the, the, what we have in the, the the power source, right? So we need to just observe and synchronize and be connected. So a grid forming can be a grid following, but a grid following cannot be a grid forming. The main, uh, we are uh, evolving, uh, and there is a lot of research right now regarding the grid forming inverters because of the microgrids. Because sometimes the microgrids need to operate islanded, and sometimes it, it have different frequencies, etc. So we need to get some uh, technology that also can generate the grid, not only follow the grid. So what's the, what's the problem that we have in this kind of systems, right? Because uh, if we have 
electronics, for example, uh, usually we have to model, right? So we have a DCAC converter, for example, and we need to uh, extract a mathematical model. We do state-based modeling, uh, whatever, and get some equations here, some basically uh, Kirchhoff currents and voltage law that we b go for state space, and we model that power electronic system in a pair of equations, right? With these equations further, we can control the system. But uh, the main problem that we have from that is that we have different models. When we have the physical converter, we ha it's totally physical, right? We have a lot of stuff there, continuous time, and we go for the mathematical model, uh, we have equations that represent that system. But we cannot represent everything because the system is very, very complex and usually we are engineers, right? So we try to uh, do some kind of piecewise the problem and get only the part that's more important to modeling. That's fine, this is the way that we do it, this is the way that the world works. But and even from the mathematical model to the electrical model, we have some differences, right? For example, we can think about an inductor. We can have the model of inductor, or you can have a better model of the inductor with a resistance in series, some, parasit some parasitics, right? Similar for the switches. We can get the capacitors uh, in a series with the switch, uh, in parallel with the switches to get more better models, but we will never be as precise as the physical model. And this problematic here is that uh, the models are different. So we lose information when we get the, when you're solving the problem. So how can we do that actually in a better way, right? So can we do the modeling real time? We can, and, but that would be very complicated because usually when we have the converters here, we need to be, uh, con we need to control the converters in a very, very high switching frequency, maybe five, 10, 100 kilohertz. So we need to calculate everything uh, 20,000 times per second. And we cannot have time to do a lot of stuff uh, that, for example, if we need to train a bigger model or something with, uh, uh, that requests time, maybe we do not have the time in control. Right? So another problem that we have in this uh, 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 new power electronics uh, based systems is the uncertainties that we have in the system. So this is a, a, a typical structure, similar to the other one that I uh, presented before. Actually, it's just the same, just in a, a more electrical model way. And the problematic that we have here is that the grid behavior that we have right now, uh, if we check the outlet here for the voltage, uh, we know what to expect, but we are not that sure we got the frequency, the amplitudes, uh, they, var they vary uh, from time to time, right? So. The problem that we have is that we can also have poor AC grids. So what do we mean by poor AC grids? Is that uh, we can may have imbalances here. Also, we can have distortion, right? So the, problem the, problem the problematics in uh, this regard is that the we cannot control the grid if we are connected to the grid, right? Because even that we have a microgrid with grid forming and grid following converters, the grid forming can generate the voltage, right? But all the others are following the one that generates. So uh, we need to be sure that this is uh, actually, uh, the grid is good, it's not poor, right? It doesn't have a, a, a low power factor here. So uh, keep uh, talking about the grid behavior. Uh, if we have a microgrid like this one, for example, similar to the previous slide that I showed you, and we have a lot of nodes here, right? Uh, the problematic that we have regarding the uncertainty is that we are not sure about this voltage here in this bus or this bus or this bus. So if one of those, let's suppose that this uh, bus here presents a poor voltage, a weak grid that we call it, that grids with high penetration uh, of uh, inductance content. If we have poor grid, weak grids or very weak grids, this system here may disconnect from the grid because they cannot follow in something that's uh, with a lot of harmonics, right? And if disconnect from the grid, this guy here is out of the generation. And if, depending on the, this uh, system here, uh, the whole system can collapse because if we take apart, if maybe if we take it out this guy, this guy here will uh, also have to be taken out and all the whole microgrid goes off. That's a big problem. Uh, so I'll discuss about some uh, problematics that we have in this regard, as uh, I discussed with you, and some pro possibilities that we can do uh, using control, right? So uh, we, I'll discuss three uh, 
ideas here. So the first one is uh, regarding the problem of the grid deterioration. As I told you, if we have the microgrid and we have one node here, just pick one node for study, right? And we connect to the grid. This grid may present a poor behavior, as I show you. So how can we do uh, overcome this problem? What we do usually is when we do the modeling, we extract this transfer function here. Uh, we get the mathematical model that we can control. And but what occurs with the grid, uh, with that system when the grid deteriorates? So if we come back here, oops, I'm advancing. If we go back here uh, and check only the grid that we have in the point of common coupling, right? Uh, basically, if the inductance of the grid goes up, right, for any reasons, uh, that, that this is the bold diagram, uh, previous uh, schematic, right, the LCL filter. So basically, we see that this resonance peak coming from the LCL, uh, it tends to be shifted towards the lower frequencies. And that's a big issue because uh, we are trying to control something, the currents that are around 5th hertz or 6th hertz, right? So they need to be, they are low frequencies. So if you have some, a resonance peak, something very big uh, nearby, the signals that we want to control, uh, we cannot control that, right? So basically, what happens is that is that if that inductance in the grid goes very high, uh, the converter may disconnect from the grid, and we stop generation, and that can create a cascade big problem. So linear controllers may struggle uh, may struggle doing this, uh, trying to solve this problem. Even that we design uh, robust controllers, for example, uh, one main uh, one of those main uh, possibilities to solve this problem is that with ca classical model operatives, lighting mode, a lot of linear and nonlinear, even that we get robust controllers, all these structures have something in common, right? They have fixed gains. So depending on the problem, I'm not saying that they are bad. I'm saying that depending on the problem, uh, even that we design robust controllers, we have a margin of operation. So if the problem deteriorates too much or is too different from the first perspective, the controller may not deal with this problem. So, however, if we design some, something that can, some adaptive controller, maybe a uh, uh, robust model reference adaptive controller based, uh, something that can adapt its gains from each uh, iteration to each iteration, uh, we can be robust enough to deal with this problem. So this, for example, is a, a, the proposed Ermerac based controller. So this is just the, main diagram with some uh, uh, main idea of working. So we have a reference model, we have an adaptive law here, and the parameters of the controller are adaptive each iteration to solve with this problem. So doing this approach, for example, uh, we can do some model simplifications and because the controller is very robust, they can adapt for a lot of situations. And for example, if we analyze for this perspective, for this research, for example, uh, if we, we plotted the fast Fourier transform of the regulated currents, and we see that uh, there is a standard, IEEE 1547, that says that all grid connected structures should present uh, less than 5% in terms of harmonic distortion of the currents. And we could achieve 2.8% with this uh, uh, structure here that combines a robust model reference adaptive controller with an adaptive sliding mode. That's a complicated controller, right? So, but uh, the main problem, the main point here is that uh, if we go for, sometimes we have to go for more complex, more fancy uh, designs to deal with the complex problems, right? So, so we achieved some good harmonic distortion and we could do with the job. Some linear controls that we tested, they disconnected due to this problematics when the grid uh, deteriorates too much, right? So, yeah. And we still see here a uh, harmonic content in 5th, 7, 11, and 13, right? This happened mostly in the three-phase grid-connected structures. You see all these peaks here, 5th, 7, 11, 13. We'll discuss later how to overcome this. Yeah, this, publish, this uh, work was published in Control Engineering Practice here, a, a good uh, control paper from IFAC, yeah. Uh, the second problematic that we have in the same line, right? I just told you about the harmonics that we saw on the fast Fourier transform, right? 5th, 7th, 11th, 13th. The problem is that uh, we were discussing about currents, that currents we are controlling. But uh, the problem is that uh, even from the grid side, if the grid deteriorates uh, and has harmonics, uh, even that we are 
robust enough to deal with this problem, uh, we see if we have, for example, this is a, a cascade control loop standard, right? So usually if we have to sync with the grid, these are the voltages that we are syncing, right? We need to be synced. So we, usually we multiply this guy here by the control law. One of the uh, so if we multiply something that's pure DC with something that has harmonics, our reference here, we also carry harmonics. But this is our reference for a control system. So actually, our reference has harmonics from the grid, right? So how can we, we are also, we are creating trouble for ourselves, right? But this is the way the, the, this kind of controls, we, we need to do this way. So basically, the problem is that if the grid is bad in terms of harmonics, these harmonics contaminate the controller, no matter what we do, right? So we need to overcome this problem as well. So uh, we have common methodologies for deal with this problematic, so we need to kill the harmonics that we got from the grid. That we need to kill something that uh, our control system is generating, basically. But usually for doing this, we have multi-resonant controllers, for example. Uh, so we need to design uh, some controllers for the specific frequencies that you want to kill, for example. If we are following fifth hertz and we want to kill the third harmonics, uh, we go for uh, one, peak re one uh, peak here, one resonant in 150, if we want to kill the, the fifth harmonic, 215, go on, right? The problem of doing this is that this is a linear controller, so basically we cannot adapt with this guy here. And also, even every time that we do this kind of resonance here, uh, we mess up very much with the phase of the system, of the controller. Basically, if we try to compensate too much, the controller may not be able to regulate due to the complexity and to the phase variations that we have here. So this is the way that we the usually is uh, developed to do with this problem, but it has some limitations because we cannot do this in an, uh, uh, as, as well as you do this one time, we cannot do differently, right? We need to redesign everything. So what occurs basically, if we need to compensate the additional harmonics. Right now we have 5th, 7, 11, 13, as I told you before. But what about if you want to compensate more? Uh, we need to redesign everything, right? So, yep, yep. So uh, the proposed solution again was to do some kind of uh, adaptive harmonics compensation, specifically for the frequency that we want to kill, right? So uh, we incorporate into our control system some uh, adaptive harmonics compensation here. This technique can be applicable for any kind of current controllers. Uh, we just have to do this kind of follow this methodology of doing the the adaptability. Uh, have in mind that we have something for synchronism over here. As I told you, we need to sync with the grid, right? Even that's grid forming. One will generate the voltage, all the others will follow. So we need to do have some synchronism for most of the converters. So assuming that we have a common filter, for example, to extract the voltage of the, the grid here to be sure that we are synced, right? Uh, Additional components can be derived from this guy here because this delivers uh, the voltage in the exactly frequency that we want to follow, fifth hertz or sixth hertz. But we can use math to generate the others and break these structures in uh, phase and quadrature, amplitude and phase. And we can do this uh, recursively for how many harmonics we want to do. So for this guy here, we compensated four components, fifth, seven, 11, 13. And in this way that I just told you, so if we have our control law here, uh, we have a lot of parameters, uh, a lot of tetas and si internal signals for our controller, but if we get some, uh, if we get from the common filter, we can generate the, uh, and adapt actually, the fifth components in amplitude and phase, the seven, 11, 13, and go on. So basically we need to, uh, we don't care about the amplitudes and phase. It will adapt from time to time to solve this problem. So. Uh, each component is decomposed in phase and quadrature, and we can, of course, in terms of complexity, we had a lot of gains here, right? Previously, we had just five gains, say six gains. And now we have uh, two gains each for each component that we want to compensate. So this creates a lot of complexity to our systems. But the, the benefit is that with this technique, we could improve 35% in the total harmonics distortion. If we check it here, 5, 7, 11, 13, mostly 13 and 50, they are very uh, much more compensated 
when we compare to the previous structure without the compensation. And that's a lot in terms of uh, uh, improvement because if we have, let's suppose, 2 to 3% of improvement, uh, we're talking about the efficiency of renewable energy sources that we need to be efficiently to deal with the, 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 uh, the renewable matrix, right? Yeah. And uh, another uh, topic here that I talk about, about uh, I did talk about, about uh, regarding adaptive controllers, right, for solving power electronics problem. But uh, we have some problematics with this kind of controllers that uh, we are uh, proud of have uh, proposed some solutions. Uh, one of these is how should the initial adaptive gain should be chosen for these controllers that I just showed you? Because, uh, you know, they, we can discuss, they are adaptive, right? So they will do the job and we adapt according to the necessity. That's right. But how should we tune the controllers? We need to get some initial gains, initial values for these kind of controllers, right? So basically, uh, even that the controllers are adaptive, if we check, for example, the Yanu uh, book here, that's a very, uh, main robust adaptive control book, we have this kind of uh, statement here. They need, the chosen of the parameters need to be close to the real parameters to get a good performance. But how can we do that if we don't know which system we are trying to solve? Or depending on the problematic of the system, we don't know who will be the, the real gains. So usually uh, to overcome this problem, we had to test with uh, Maybe we initialize these guys with random gains. We check the, the convergence value and reinitialize the system with these values closer to the convergence. But depending on the application, we cannot do that, right? Because uh, we cannot have this liberty of uh, testing randomly, seeing the result, and feedbacking these values. So we need to do this in a better way. So uh, as I told you, the common methodology for handling this problem is the initialization of the adaptive controller, and later we we, uh, we retune the system with the previous values that we got with a good performance. So we execute maybe multiple times and refine this from time to time until the performance is really, really good, right? However, uh, so to overcome this problem, uh, as I can uh, show you here, show you here. So basically, this is the current that we are injecting to the grid from a three-phase current connected controller. Is a this was a uh, six kilowatts uh, converter. So basically we have nothing connected here. These are just the, the our, uh, noise here. In this point, we sync with the grid. Then we have this overshoot that's transient. Then we have steady state. Then when we go for the reference uh, load step that we have here, uh, the converter disconnected from the grid because we have a lot of overshoot. That came from the wrong initialization of the parameters. Everything was good until it's not good anymore. So the, incorrect, the incorrectly uh, initialization can lead to bad performance. So the proposed solution was a self-tuning parameterization for uh, doing, uh, doing that. We use a metaheuristics, so we use a GA. We try GA, genetic algorithms for this guy. We try also a particle storm optimization, and both were great to solve this problem. So basically, we feed uh, offline, right? This is totally doing offline. So basically, as soon as we uh, develop the control structure, uh, we run on MATLAB, Python, whatever. For this guy here, we, we, run, we did run on MATLAB. So basically, we run our plant in MATLAB, and we're trying to find the best gains, of course, according to the stability restrictions, right? because we have a lot of equations that and uh, conditions that need to be matched. So we check this from time to time uh, in this uh, metaheuristic algorithm here, deliver us the best case, the optimal, optimal op the optimized values to run and deal with this problem. And uh, so basically we have a lot of parameters from that uh, structure that I showed you before. We have uh, gamma and kappa, they both are from, uh, they, these guys here set the dynamic of the system. Uh, we have some parameters from slide mode, we have some adaptive parameters, and the genetic algorithm delivered this set of parameters. We tried for this research fmincom as well and uh, simulate an annealing, right? So we see that the parameters, the solutions are very different from one of the other, right? Uh, maybe because some of them have some, are very good finding local minimum, global minimum, etc. but GA was very good solving this problem. And 
this was conducted offline, so there is no harm for the real-time op operation. Uh, it's just an additional step to uh, optimize our system, right? Uh, and so we have this restriction as well from, uh, for this controller, this was the only restriction that we get from the stability analysis. So basically we need to be sure that this will be much lower than one. Otherwise we may harm the stability. So in this condition, as well as the overshoot, uh, over voltage, over current, low voltage, low current, cu uh, control loss going, exploding, whatever. We can, se we can set whatever conditions we want to for the application. And the optim op optimal method will find these gains here accordingly to our operation, our best uh, operation, right? So, uh, and of course, the effectiveness of the methodology relies very much on the accuracy of the plant. Remember back when the beginning, when I told you that we have problems in the modeling. So we need to be sure that the model is accurate or accurate uh, enough for the problem that we want to solve. Otherwise, we, can, we may find f uh, values here that are very good to that uh, model part of the problem, but they may, they may not be good enough for the practice, for the practical op applications. Uh, yeah, basically, yep. So uh, I, I forgot to put the results here, but I can, I have, think that I have on backup slide, but basically doing this, uh, we, could do, we could make this controller here that I showed before, this guy here, for nothing have overshoot, so it had almost no overshoot here and didn't disconnect from the grid anymore. We just copy and paste the values that we got on MATLAB from the uh, metaheuristics uh, initialization, copy this, copy and paste for the DSP, for the real application, it worked great, right? So, uh, of course, our model was very accurate, but it, it depends on uh, which problem we want to solve. But basically, uh, this uh, optimal initialization is a very, very, good way of solving, of uh, providing the best possible performance for adaptive controllers. And as we see that we have a lot of emerging of, uh, research area of adaptives right now, so that's uh, very interesting. So for me, right, <laughs> maybe it's not that interesting for you, but for me it's very interesting. So, uh, this also was published in Control Engineering Practice. We did the same similar uh, with particles for optimization with another controller. Uh, that one was published on International Journal of Adaptive Control with Signal Processing. So, yep. Then uh, enough of problematics. Let's discuss a, lo a lot of uh, a little bit about the perspectives that we have in uh, power electronics and power systems, and what sh we should uh, expect for the, the the future, right? So basically, uh, we know that the grid in the U.S. is aging because most of the grid that we have is. Uh, past 30s, right? So we need a lot of uh, investment to upgrade the systems. And right now that we have a lot of renewable energy sources penetration, uh, we need to, because if we think about, for example, we have a solar plant or if each consumer has its own small solar farm to generate its own energy, that's fine. But we need smart meters. Maybe we need uh, additional transformers from the consumer company in the, the road that we didn't need 10, 20 years ago and we need more protection systems. So we need, this costs time and a lot of money. So we need to do this kind of uh, improvement in the grid from time to time. So this is very complex and expensive, right? Uh, so basically uh, in the same topic uh, regarding the aging, every day more or less 500,000 of uh, US consumers lose power for one hour. And in the same uh, uh, statistics here, more or less uh, 0.8 billions of people have no ac access to electricity right now. So uh, if we check the map, the electricity access, maybe 13 years ago, uh, uh, America Latina here was in a big spot in the no 100% electricity, right? So right now we are overcome this. We have no problem anymore. But we still see that uh, then we still have a lot of problems in Africa, right? Uh, this is Yemen, this is Pakistan. Uh, so North Korea here. So we have a lot of areas that we still don't have enough electricity access, right? So there is a lot of uh, uh, job to be done to get that, right? Because if sometimes we, we lose internet access for one hour, you get crazy, right? What about the electricity? So in, in the same way of the outages and uh, aging, uh, we see that 26% more or less of the problems that we have in our uh, distribution system comes from the weather problem. So basically, 
how can we do with that? Because storms will happen uh, forever, right? So that's something that we have to deal with that. And just for uh, statistics here, uh, for an arbor in 2023, maybe $2 million was uh, the cost for outages, right? So, and this is a big problem. So, uh, and it's also related to uh, electrification and transportation because uh, when we think about the EVs, EVs are great, right? But they need uh, also, they also request that maintenance from the grid that I was discussing about the aging, right? So. Now we have a lot of EVs, so we need a lot of parking spots, uh, uh, a lot of uh, charging spots, right? And charging spots are very expensive, and they, need, they also require better protection systems. They also require maybe new substations, and this is very complex. Because of this, uh, we knew that California is getting a lot of problems in terms of electricity uh, 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 power because uh, from one time to another time, they had a lot of EVs, uh, but they couldn't uh, make their grid appropriate to deal with this problem. So, uh, of course, I'm not saying that EVs are bad, right? EVs, if we compare, if we, if we, when we compare with internal combustion engines, they are much more efficient, right? We have, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, we have maybe 85% of efficiency in the EV against 25% for combustion engines in general, right? From EVs, the main problem comes from the losses that we have in the tires. The tires losses in the com internal combustion engines, we don't care because that's a small amount of losses, right? For the EVs, that's the, the majority losses that we have. So of course, they are much more efficient. So I really think that we need to, that's a good way of uh, reducing the, the, the environmental impact. We are going on that, that's good, but we need to keep in mind that this costs money and it's not simple. It's expensive, it's complex to do this, uh, get everything, all the conditions that we need to get the, the, a lot of EVs and be sure that we cannot have anyone outage because of that, right? So right now in California, one fourth of the, uh, the, the car sales are electric. That's a lot, right? So maybe, I'm not sure if 25% uh, of the grids be improved there. That's maybe the problem. So we have uh, auto-warding with uh, EVs that's totally connected with EVs, right? Because when you talk about the EVs, that's great. Oh, hey, okay, we have a lot of efficiency. Uh, they are green, right? They don't pollute that much as internal combustion engines. But what will be done with the old EV batteries? Right now we are good, but what about 15 or 20 years later? We have tons of batteries that need to be discarded, right? So, it, but however, even that we uh, uh, discard the EV batteries, they have a, a, basically, this is the capacity that we have from EV battery, this is the cycles. We have this knee point here. As far as we drop from the more or less 80% of the knee point, we consider this battery not proper anymore for EVs. But they have 80% of the capacity because right now the aging of the battery is very uh, uh, bad, right? So basically when we arrive at this point here, you need to change the, if the batteries for your car. But what to do with that, right? Uh, we just discarded that, that's not good. So we may use them as second life batteries in our power systems. So basically we can in, uh, use these batteries in our uh, PV systems, maybe to do some hybrid systems, our battery management system as well as backup. So we should integrate these batteries and we are, uh, uh, we have a trend of integrating the second life batteries in our microgrids and power systems, right? So that's something that we have to figure out. This is a hot topic right now, the second life batteries. How do we integrate to that? Because that's not that simple, right? Because it's a battery, it's something that we have to charge, needs to discharge, has aging, so, and it's not intermittent, right? And all this topic here, I'm reaching to the end, but all this topic regarding aging, EVs, uh, uh, outage, electric assets, etc. Uh, we come, uh, sooner or later, we need to talk ab about regulatory and policy, de policy developments, right? So basically, uh, this uh, is extracted from IEA, so this is International Energy Agency report. This is carried out all, every year. Most of the uh, uh, renowned researchers regarding power system uh, do this kind of uh, research here. We publish a big report. That's very nice. I, uh, 
I would say that for you to check later, uh, this kind of this report is very good for uh, understand the next steps regarding EVs, power systems, energy consumption, all the problems that we have uh, uh, in uh, our areas, right? So basically, this is the average annual clean energy that we need for achieve net zero emission scenario in 2050, right? So basically, we see that the advanced economies will need to invest 3.5 trillion dollars to achieve that. Uh, Ch China, $2 trillion. Emerging markets, $3 trillion. We are discussing about US, right? EVs for US is creating some kind of trouble. What about Brazil? What about China? What about India, right? Some different countries, different perspectives, right? Maybe the, if we are facing some infrastructure problematics here in US, in emerging markets, <laughs> it will be chaotic, much more uh, amplified these problems, right? So, so there is a lot of uh, 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 roads to be uh, uh, traveled to achieve this. So even if we consider APS, that's the standard scenario, uh, just to keep these things uh, not as bad as in terms of uh, environmental impact, we see that we will need, this is just uh, for 230, right? We will need, look at this uh, uh, rare earth elements that we need for the EVs and also lithium for the EV batteries. So we will need maybe two to seven times more demand in terms of rare earth elements and lithium for EVs. And we know that this is critical because this uh, mining here is carried out mostly in Africa, right? That's the underdevelopment countries. So uh, this is a big environmental impact. A lot of people work in very poor conditions by maybe $1 a month to get this. So that's uh, something that also we have to keep in discussion, right? Because if we don't see, we may don't see that, but that happens and that's very bad as well. So we need just maybe seven times and we saw the problematic that the EVs are generating. So what about if we achieve maybe 100, almost 100%, that's the, the main idea. Of course, it not be from one day to another, but for achieving maybe 100% of EVs, not 109% of the, the total uh, electric v, uh, or total vehicles that we have, you will need tons of investments. That's almost impossible for maybe the next years, right? We need a lot of improvement for that. So this is the outlook that I told you. So uh, I encourage you students to check it, che check it later. That's a very nice document for seeing the perspectives. Uh, and finally, uh, also re uh, regarding this policy here, uh, everything is related to the prices for example, the demands comes for, e for PVs, wind, etc., because the energy increased too much. If the values keep low, uh, no one will talk that much to improvement. Of course, that's, it's great to get this uh, renewable uh, discussion, absolutely. But the main uh, uh, idea for this uh, research starting is the uh, price, basically. So if we check here the oil, natural gas, coal, uh, what happened in early 2022, right? That we have a lot of uh, increasing here in the prices. We had the, the Russian-Ukraine war. And the price of the barrel, for example, the oil was from, uh, uh, the, the coal was, for example, 200, almost double, right, in one year. That's insane. I had friends in Europe that they uh, work in universities. They, are, they have very good lives there. And they were saying that, for example, the bills from, from uh, natural gas for heating was from, for example, 80 uh, euros per month to 300 euros per month, from one month to another, just because of this problem. So that's problematic, right? Because also it's related to, so basically what I try to say here is that uh, our main uh, careers, research, etc., they are uh, related a lot with the uh, uh, geopolitical and the way that the world goes regarding development uh, and of course the prices right uh, the demand tends to come and arise when you have uh, problematic in terms of price right? so uh, and this is the global energy investment that we need for clean energy fossils uh, so we will need also uh, we are going good, actually, because oh, oops, my bad. We are going good because uh, 
a few years ago, we were spending $1 for every fossil fuel. Now we are spending much more, almost 80% more from, uh, from clean energy. So we are going good to a better renewable energy matrix, right? But still have a lot to do. And that's not that simple. It's this uh, uh, discussion that we can, we should change everything and go for EVs from one day to another. That's not the way that should go. So we need to be careful about it. And finally, the, just a, a few uh, thoughts about AI in control and power electronics. So generative AI are, are here, right? So problem uh, you are using to do your tests, uh, reports, etc. So you're asking ChatGPT, please answer this form to me, right? Something like this. So basically, uh, how can we do, uh, how can we leverage this for power electronics control power system applications? We may be used for optimization of our jobs, our ideas, right? Use this generative AI to provide optimization of our problems. That's totally feasible. I see a lot of improvement for that. Uh, because generative AI can generate new data based on new model, on the models that we have. So basically, uh, the accuracy of our models tend to be totally related to the data that we have. So if you can generate new, very accurate data, we can go for better models, and better models lead to better results. So we have, I see, a lot of point here in terms of optimization for our problems. Uh, yeah. So can we stop AI? I don't think so, because we could stop internet, right? So we couldn't stop a lot of things that changed our lives. AI will change our lives for sure. It's already changing, right? So, and what about our jobs, right? <laughs> but I really think that our jobs are safe because uh, we need a lot of people in the, as I told you, in the power system area, power electronics area. AI cannot connect a converter into the grid. AI cannot make a substation, right? Cannot design that. That's uh, far from, because uh, it includes also some uh, understanding of maybe uh, market, uh, cost, etc. This feeling the AI doesn't have. So uh, I think really think that your jobs are totally safe. So, and also, uh, finally, uh, just one uh, thought here. Uh, in 883, the first transformer was developed. It had 56% of efficiency. Uh, right now, one uh, distribution transformer has up to 98% of efficiency, right? But if we change, if we look to that, it's a uh, square box, right? That has uh, uh, AC to AC, right? So it's a square box that converts energy, just uh, up, or, uh, up or down. And it's the same box here, right? But the efficiency is almost perfect, right? We cannot go for 100 because we will always have losses. So basically, uh, what we have here is that the grid is changing from time to time, but we don't see that changing too much. Too much but it is changing. And uh, is so basically, uh, there is a lot of work to be done, as uh, we discussed briefly regarding the policies, the tendencies, all the problems that we have to overcome, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't see uh, uh, a better spot for you, students, to be uh, right now regarding the market, because the market in the next years will be wild for electrical engineers. They will need a lot of you. And I discussed briefly, briefly with some engineers from DTE, that's the, the main cons being, uh, company that we have in Detroit area, and they were discussing that most of the, 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 main, the task force that they, ha they have regarding power systems is retiring next three to four, five years. So, and they will need a lot of good people to solve the problem, right? So, yeah, thank you so much. I think that I am on time. Yep. We can do on time, on real time. Right now, uh, for that uh, jobs, uh, that research we did offline, because as I told you, for power electronics, we usually have to calculate the control law, the control action, 10,000 times, 20,000 times per second. That's very, so we have no time to wait for some information to arrive. Right? However, we are, we discuss about another uh, topic that we could do similar, but in windows of time. So we could maybe predict the grid behavior, 
feedback the controller, but in windows of time, from which you five minutes we predict with how is the...